So the goal of this video is to talk about prime numbers and to talk about unique factorization in the sense of any integer that's not 0 or plus or minus 1 can be factored uniquely into a product of primes. Okay, so let's begin with a definition. Um, so we'll just recall the standard definition of prime number. Um, an integer p that's not equal to 0 or plus or minus 1 is prime if its only divisors are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus p. So we have some examples we could write down. Right, so stand, so, some primes you might recall are 3, the only divisors of 3 are plus minus 1 and plus minus 3, uh, 11, the only divisors of 11 are plus minus 1 and plus minus 11. Um, using our definition, negative numbers will, were, are going to be allowed to be primes, so negative 13 is a prime. Um, the only divisors of negative 13 are plus minus 1 and plus minus 13, so these are all examples of primes. And a number like 4 is not a prime. Why is 4 not a prime? Well, it's because 2 divides 4, for example. And 2 is not plus minus 1, and 2 is not plus minus 4. Okay, so these are this is the standard definition of primes. Um, one thing that I'll note here is that if p and q are prime, we'll be using this fact a little bit later, if p and q are prime and p divides q, then p must equal plus or minus q. Okay, why is this true? Well, if p divides q, well, the only divisors of q are plus minus 1 and plus minus q. Well, since p is prime, we know that p is not equal to plus or minus 1, so it must be the case that p is equal to plus or minus q. Okay, so this is going to be a fact that's going to be useful for us. Okay, so our first result on primes is going to actually be a reformulation of the definition of prime. So we're going to say that p is prime if and only if whenever p divides b times c, then p must divide b or p must divide c. So this is going to be a reformulation of the definition since it's an if and only if statement. Okay, so let's begin the proof. And the first thing we're going to prove is the forward direction. So I'll say suppose that p is prime. and b and c are integers such that p divides bc. Okay, so let's examine p and b together. Um, since p is prime, we know it's only positive divisors are 1 and p, so we could say since p is prime, the only possibilities for the GCD of p and b are 1 or p. Right. The only possible divisors of p are 1 and p, or rather the only positive divisors of p are 1 and p. Um, so the only possibilities for the GCD here are 1 and p. Okay, so what can we say? Well, if the GCD of p and b is 1, then by an earlier result, we know that p must divide c. And so I've taken the time to write that earlier result on the side here. In, the, in this example, we're taking a equal to p, and we're using this, this result we proved earlier. So if the GCD of p and b is 1, we know right away that p must divide c. Okay, what about the other possibility? Well, if the GCD of p and b is p, well, it's just saying that p must divide p and p must divide b, right? The GCD has to divide b, um, then we get that p divides b. Okay, so that finishes the forward direction. Okay, so now we're ready to prove the backwards direction, and we're going to proceed by contradiction. So first we'll prove this for positive p, and then we'll show that it holds for negative p. Okay, so I'll suppose that p is bigger than 1, and p has the property that whenever p divides b times c, then p divides b or p divides c. And I'll say suppose that p is not prime. Okay, let's see what kind of contradiction we can arrive at. Well, if p is not prime, I could say that there exists some integer d such that two things hold. Well, d divides p, and d is strictly bigger than 1 and strictly less than p. Okay, well, then there exists some integer, let's say, j and z, such that p is equal to d times j, and we also have that j is strictly bigger than 1 and strictly less than p. Okay, well, what do we have? We have that p is equal to a product of two numbers, so let's use this to our advantage. Well, we know that p must divide p, right? Any number must divide itself, so p 
divides dj. Okay, well, let's use the property that p has. We know that whenever p divides a product of two numbers, it has to divide one of those numbers. So, we have that p divides d, or p divides j. Okay, well, what's the problem? Well, hence, we get that p is less than or equal to d, or p is less than or equal to j. But this is a contradiction because we know that d is strictly less than p and j is strictly less than p. So this is a contradiction. So p is prime. Okay, so we've proved this for positive p and now let's circle back and prove this for negative p as well. Okay, so now we're left to show this for negative p. Okay, so I'll suppose that p is less than negative 1, and p has this property that whenever p divides bc, then p divides b or p divides c. And the one thing we'll note here is that negative p is bigger than 1. So negative p is positive, and we've already proved the claim for positive numbers. Okay, so I'll say suppose that negative p divides bc. Let's check if negative p also has this property. Well, if negative p divides bc, then p divides bc. Um, by our property, so thus, by the property that p satisfies, p divides b or p divides c. And we know from an earlier result, for example, that if a divides b, then negative a divides b. Um, so then we can say that negative p divides b or negative p divides c. So negative p has the same property and thus must be prime by our earlier proof. Must be prime since negative p is bigger than 1. And now since negative p is prime, then p must also be prime. So, so because p and negative p share the same set of divisors. So since negative p is prime, so is p. Right? p and negative p share the same set of divisors. So this concludes our proof. So the forward direction of this theorem has a name. Um, it's called Euclid's lemma. And Euclid's lemma just says if p is prime and b and c are integers and p divides b c, then p divides b or p divides c. So this is just the forward direction of the previous theorem. Um, this forward direction actually has an important corollary, which we'll need when we talk about unique prime factorizations. Um, and the corollary says the following. It says, suppose p is prime and a1 through an are integers and p divides their product, then p must divide one of the integers. So p divides a1 or p divides a2 or so on and so forth. So we're going to prove this result, and this is going to be useful when we talk about prime factorizations in a second. So we're going to prove this by induction on n, and we'll take n to be bigger than or equal to 2. When n is equal to 1, we just have p divides a1 implies p divides a1. Okay, so let's start with the base case. So the base case is going to be n is equal to 2. So I'll say suppose that we have a1 and a2 are integers, and p divides a1 times a2. Well, this is already straightforward because we've proved Euclid's lemma. By Euclid's lemma, so by Euclid's lemma, we know that p divides a1 or p divides a2. So the base case is just an example of Euclid's lemma. So let's get to the inductive hypothesis now. Okay, so we're going to assume that our claim holds for n and show that it holds for n plus 1. So that is, we're going to assume that anytime p divides a product of n integers, then it must divide one of those integers. So let's write that all out. So I'll say, suppose that for some n greater than or equal to 2, if p divides a product of n integers, then p divides one of those integers. Okay, so that's our inductive hypothesis. And now I'm going to take n plus 1 integers, and suppose p divides a product of n plus 1 integers. Well, how do we go about this? I can say, okay, then let's let's be clever about this. We'll say p divides a1 times a2, a3 up to a n plus 1 in parentheses. Okay, well, what do we know? We know that we now have a product of two integers, right? a1 is an integer, and then all the stuff in the parentheses is another integer. So we can say by Euclid's lemma, 
So by Euclid, we know that P divides A1 or P divides A2 times A3 times dot 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 times An plus 1. Okay, well, we have that P divides A1 or that P divides a product of N integers. So now we can use our inductive hypothesis. So by our inductive hypothesis, so by induction, we get that P divides A1 or if we break this up now using our inductive hypothesis, P divides A2 or P divides A3 or so on and so forth or P divides An plus 1 and we get that P divides a product of N plus 1 integers. So our claim is proved by induction. Okay, so we're finally ready to prove our main result. And this main result is called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And this is a result you typically see in maybe elementary school or middle school that every integer that's not zero, one, or negative one is a product of primes. And on top of that, it is a product of primes in a unique way. So let's explore what this means. So the first thing we'll say is that if n is an integer and n is not zero or plus or minus one, then I can write n as a product of primes. Okay, so that's the existence portion of the theorem and we'll have an existence portion of our proof to prove this line. Moreover, this expression is unique in the sense that if I take a number n and you give me two prime factorizations, so one of them is made up of r primes and the other one is made up of s primes, um, then r must equal s and after reordering we have that p, each of the pi's is equal to plus or minus each of the qi's where, so I should write uh, these numbers p1 up to pr and q1 up to qs r prime. One thing I'll note here is that if n can be expressed as p1, p2 up to pr, then I know that negative n can be expressed as negative p1 times p2 up to pr. So we only need to show this for positive values of n. So we only show this for n bigger than 1. So that's kind of the nice, nice thing here. We, once we have this for positive n, we automatically get it for negative n. So the existence portion of the proof actually uses well ordering. So I'll suppose that there exists an integer n where n is bigger than one with no prime factorization. So with no factorization. Um, by well ordering, there is a smallest such integer. So by well ordering, uh, let k be the smallest such integer. Let k be the smallest. Okay. Well, what do we know about k? One thing we know is that k is definitely not prime because prime numbers already have a factorization. Two, the prime factorization of two is two. Five, the prime factorization of five is just five. So we know that k is not prime because k equal to k would be a prime factorization. Well, that means that k is composite. So if k is composite, we know that there exists integers a and b such that k is equal to a times b and a and b are strictly less than k and strictly larger than 1. Well, since a and b are less than k, we know that they have prime factorizations. We can say that a is p1 up to pm and b is, let's call them p1 prime up to pn prime. For some primes, p1 through pm and p1 prime through through pn prime. Well, then I can say that n, or rather, sorry, k, which is equal to ab, is now just p1 up to pm times p1 prime up to pn prime is a prime factorization. But wait a second, we assume that k has no prime factorization, so this is a contradiction. All right, so this is a contradiction. So notice that this proof is not constructive. This proof shows that a prime factorization exists without ever telling you how to get the prime factorization. So it's a contradiction proof. Okay, so now we can move on to the uniqueness proof. Okay, so now on to the uniqueness portion. And how does a uniqueness proof typically go? We assume that there are two of something and we show that those two things are actually the same. So I'm going to assume 
that n has two prime factorizations. Namely, it can be written as a product of p1 through pr, and it can be written as a product of q1 through qs, where these guys are all primes. Okay. And so what do I notice? I can say, okay, well, the first thing I notice is p1 has to divide n. We know that as a result, p1 has to divide q1, q2, up to qs. By our corollary that we just proved, we know that p1 has to divide qi for some i, right, for one of these i's. Well, let's reorder these so that the, p, the, the qi that p1 actually divides is q1. So reordering so that p1 divides q1. Okay, well, remember, p1 is a prime, q1 is a prime, so p1 has to be plus or minus q1, or rather, yeah, p1 has to be plus or minus q1. Okay, so now I'm going to take my expression, and I'm going to replace this p1 right here with a plus or minus q1. So I can say plus or minus q1 times p2 up to pr must equal q1, q2, up to qs. Okay, and what can we do? We can cross out these q1s. So hence, we get that plus or minus p2 up to pr must equal q2 up to qs. And we continue to play this game, right? We play the same game. We could say, okay, p2 divides both sides. So now, p2 divides the left-hand side. So this implies that p2 must divide q2 up to qs. So this implies that p2 must divide one of the qi's, and we reorder so that p2 has to divide q2. And this is going to give me that p2 is plus or minus q2. Okay, so what do we end up with? We end up with plus or minus q2, p3, up to pr, is equal to q2, q3, up to qs. And what are we going to do? We're just going to cross out these q2s. Okay, so this is, this is the general idea. We just keep going until we run out of terms. One thing we notice is that if r is equal to s, we get that pi is equal to plus or minus qi for every single i. Um, but what if r is bigger than s? If r is bigger than s, then what we end up with is we end up with something rather peculiar. We end up with plus or minus p s plus 1, p s plus 2, up to p r is equal to 1. So we end up with a prime factorization of 1. This is a contradiction, right? So this is impossible. And similarly, if r is less than s, we end up with a prime factorization of 1. So this is going to be similar. Okay, so the only possibility is that r is equal to s, and each of the pi's is plus or minus each of the qi's. And that gives us our uniqueness proof. So we're done.